Sonic Talk. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sonic Talk, episode 548, uh, recorded today, Wednesday, the 5th of September. I guess we're getting towards the end of the summer, though it hasn't quite felt like it. I'm not wearing shorts anymore, but I know a man who is, but we'll get onto that in a little bit in a little bit of time. Uh, Sonic Talk is the podcast to do with music technology, anything to do with synthesizers, software, uh, even DJ stuff, iOS um, uh, controllers, live production, studio work, all of those things are encompassed in this. And uh, we thank uh, Isotope, who will be providing a prize a little bit later on. You can win a copy of their excellent Vocal Synth, Vocal Processing Suite, Vocal Synth 2, in fact. Uh, that will happen about halfway through the show, so do check that out. I want to say hello to our YouTube chatties. Hello, YouTube chatties. And also to our friends in the IRC chat. We've got two. I did actually look into, uh, um, what was it called? Discord. But I couldn't find a way to embed it properly in the site, so it would have to be in a different window. So until I can find that out, it looks quite good, so thanks for those who suggested it, but I still need to work out some things. So for now, we're going to stick with the IRC and the YouTube stuff. So um, once again, uh, we have a full quota of guests. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Matthew Hodson, who's there in his uh, studio uh, in Brighton, where he's also uh, like. course director. Is it course director? Of course, course leader. Course uh, yeah, so I, I run the music production course, yeah, at BIM in Brighton, the British and Irish Modern Music Institute. And yep. uh, yeah, we've been there today actually signing off a load of student work. That's just finished for the previous academic year, um, which is always great. I, it's, it's one of the best things about the job, actually, is actually hearing what the students finish and do as their final output on the way out of the course, basically. And, um, you know, we was all sat around today listening to stuff, just actually just thinking how great this is and um we had some great meetings as well with um i can't say too much but with some record labels about what we can actually do with this music in a more meaningful way um rather than it just kind of just disappearing once they finish at the college so it's been re really great um great day today great afternoon oh that sounds really good yeah i imagine it's very positive because i mean a lot of a, a lot of new ta young talent is outstandingly good and you just think oh how on earth did they get oh that good absolutely. at that age <laughs> yeah i mean a lot of them they come on the course and they're already motoring that you know they're putting out so much on youtube and Bandcamp and soundcloud and things like that that um you know that that the quality when they're coming in is so great and, and then the, the the course that i run essentially is about developing them as a freelancer so they can exist in this current music production world um as we all know you have to put your hat yeah. on many different things at many that's different true time. so it's just getting getting them prepared for that really well good that sounds like a very positive day well thanks for joining yeah, us uh, matthew uh, i wish i was where steve was though yeah well i was gonna i was gonna make that the the, the, the last right. reveal just so that if uh, those of you who maybe have just tuned in or you're just seeing the final edited version uh Hello, Gaz Williams, uh, gazwilliams.me, uh, bass player, a music technologist, producer, mastering engineer, all of those kind of things. How are you, Gaz? Yeah, well, I was thinking about those students. They might superficially be making good music, but there's no real kind of lived-in sort of weary <laughs> kind of yeah. blood pouring out of the eyes kind of thing going on there is it it's all kind of it's all technique and twiddly uh, yeah. youngsters in your dreams what do they know <laughs> <laughs> they haven't done the hours in the van gaz maybe yet yeah yeah god well, that's to um, come no only joking uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but i mean isn't it i mean gosh some of the youngsters i've been you know working with oh i, I mean i can this 14 year old was showing me some stuff he was doing and that and that was amazing you know like really really good and yeah. he was playing all the instruments himself and i was just like oh just how good are they gonna get um so yes uh it's definitely uh an intriguing prospect i mean you know i was thinking about this as well just sort of um whatever you want to learn there is just uh, well actually my mum has just started learning the ukulele and it's the first instrument she's ever picked up and she's having so much fun with it and she's uh she's got caught there's just so many lessons on youtube and she's um she's obsessed with it and she's making really good progress with it um largely to do with the fact that there's just such a lot of and you can just pick it there. yeah and you can pick it up anytime you like uh, i suppose as well yeah yeah so i mean yeah it's interesting um but i think this is something that we've talked about in 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 previous um sonic talks so it's sort of like um what is it all going to lead to what you know what is where is it going when is the new 
incredible music that's going to come out that's a, you know a culmination of everything and uh I, actually i've been hearing little bits of it and certain people ah you know just like the more different influences and different techniques and everything can all be mushed up together that's where the new stuff comes from so uh, i'm very interested if anyone can point me in the right direction though to listen to brand new musical ideas so it's um it, um it's something i'm trying to seek out at the moment uh, and also what is the current standard for excellent production you know that's mm. that's so well with, uh, with, yeah. with things no bass line mm. and excellent vocal production skills as far as i could tell <laughs> but that's just pop isn't it yeah uh, uh, so, and, and no hi-hats either no hi hats either. That said, Steve Hillier in his uh, retreat down in Spain there, and we were just commenting before we started the show how amazing a webcam can look when it's given the right amount of light. So uh, Steve Hillier, yeah, of course, uh, DJ, producer, songwriter. Uh, do you do education stuff as well? I think you do, don't you? Uh, yeah, I, I work at uh, BIM uh, with Matt, or actually work, working with Matt is a, a new thing that's hopefully going to be starting in a few weeks' time. Uh, I've worked at BIM for a while, and the, the, the thing that I teach there is songwriting, which I, I prefer to put under the umbrella of creativity more than songwriting because it, it doesn't really capture everything. But yeah, I, I, we work at the same place. Wow. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's all right. So I'm a bit concerned that you're going to get uh, sunburn. I, I mean, if you need to dash off, if you need to get, if you need to dash off and get a hat or move an umbrella, you know that's fine. Just, just let us know. I, I think can... I might do that. I think that the billions and billions of photons that are coming from this star and making the webcam look good are also going to give me severe exposure. <laughs> well, so, lovely um, to have you though. <laughs> but it's hopefully, great to be here. hopefully you won't be too cooked by the time we uh, by the time we finish the show. Anyway, um, a, a couple of things. Uh, first. First of all, I wanted to say um, Nob Nobcon is next weekend, and we are uh, a friend of ours, Jim Hayward, who runs the excellent Synth Memes Facebook group, is going over and is going to do some filming stuff. And we'll also be running a live blog. He'll be posting some stuff to it. But if you're going and you see anything and you want to post anything to Instagram, um, may I suggest that you post uh, using the, ha the hashtag SSNobcon18, because then we can pick it up and we might well include it in the live stream for the uh, live blog. I just wanted to post that out there. So coverage will be coming over at the weekend so uh, i hope uh, uh, so we couldn't have made it in person but uh, like i say jim's going to be there if you see jim say hi he's the one who looks quite a lot like tom cruise as i keep telling him although nobody else seems to see it apart from me maybe i've just got some kind of fixation anyway um right let's get on to some uh some interesting stuff first of all right this hi. is uh latest if you're listening to this in mono it's just noise in stereo, this is from loop pop it's a cool effect but in quad, he explores you're in the middle of a storm the idea of quadraphonic sound in various different ways. And if that's what spatial modulation can do to noise, imagine what it can do to the rest of your music. Now, you this is any stereo, but... Part, so you probably won't get what the fuss is about by listening to this. But if you create music, you've got to try listening to or creating music with spatial motion, preferably quadraphonic. It's a lovely piece, actually, that opening thing. It's got a lovely atmosphere. But this was a, a piece by Luke Pop who contacted us and said, oh, you know, you should try it. And I, I don't have a quad system here, but uh, he goes through a number of different methods. Uh, one is within the DAW. Uh, the other one is in, and let me see, I listed them here. Uh, one is in the w DAW, one's in Eurorack, one is using VCV rack, which, as we know, is a, a sort of free environment. And the one, uh, he talks about the idea of cr maybe creating some VCV patches. And as we've talked about before, maybe putting them on a Raspberry Pi, so it's a kind of dead dedicated uh, spatial panning system obviously you need a sound card and stuff on it and the patch would just be running and you would kind of it would be headless apart from some uh, MIDI controllers but I wondered you know this brings up an interesting question quadraphonic sound has been it's been in and out hasn't it I mean you know as of many other spatial sounds and and we we've, we're starting to see it more in like festival things and in live art installations and sort of experimental electronic uh, gigs but it's been in and out of favour. I mean, it started coming in, I'm in the 60s or 70s, wasn't it? Everybody was raving about quadraphonic sound. And it just seems to be always there. But I've never really tried it. And I wonder whether any of you guys had uh, experimented with quad. I suppose it's different to 5.1 or quite similar to 5.1. Maybe I'll start with you, guys, because I know you, you do mastering stuff. So, I mean, you know, do you ever get asked to do things either 5.1 you know, or, or more importantly, quadraphonic stuff? 
Um, very, very rarely, if ever, I'm thinking. Um, but I mean, I love, well, I've been playing around with some surroundy ideas and uh, I've got the Waves NX headphone system here, which allows you to get, have a, like a virtual uh, surround sound for headphones um i think we've talked about this before and the thing that's really interesting about that system is that uh um unlike um other systems that have existed in the past what's interesting with this is that it, it moves your head so you actually move your head around within a within a um a surround sound environment so you can actually go and go towards the speakers and back and forwards towards the speakers and and um yeah and i'm really keen to get hold of a pair of those Audis, which are the headphones that uh, oh, you tried those at Superfoods, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, they were incredible. Yeah, really, really good, and that's got the Waves NX built into them. Um, uh, but I'm actually going to get a, I'm getting another set of monitors for the back wall in my studio, so I'll be able to do a little bit more surround sound stuff. And it's something I've always been interested in. I remember having my mind blown listening to um, the quadraphonic version of dark side of the moon and the um on the run track uh the vcs3 thing when you hear it in in quadraphonic it's really it, it just makes a lot more sense the whole kind of mix the way that the mixes and it all spins around it sounds really cool and that was what 1973 um so uh it it still does feel quite on it's still on it not it hasn't had its day yet it's still such a lot of effort for people to set up i recently got hold of a gentle giant like a stephen wilson um gentle giant thing called uh three piece suite which he revisited the first three gentle giant albums in the early 70s and uh, has done uh 5.1 uh mixes of those and what's good about them is the those albums have got some really kind of wild out there sort of proggy kind of <laughs> experimental sections and those rendered in surround sound are really interesting. Uh, uh, and I think this is the thing that makes, uh, you know, a lot of the surround sound stuff that has come out in the past, it tends to be a bit conservative. It like puts like a kind of like audience or just little atmosphere in this, in the, in the rear rather than really strong sweeping panning effects. And this loop pop video is really good for, for that though. I mean, it really goes into lots of different um, applications of, of that. Uh, I mean, yes, yeah, specifically with more of a, a quadraphonic focus. Um, loop pop's videos are brilliant, aren't they? I yeah, really he's definitely got a, a um, style thing. Yeah, he's, he does really good stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, it is, uh, it, uh, it is that dilemma though, isn't it? As interesting as it is, how many who's, people Who's gonna hear have? it? <laughs> Who's going to hear it? <laughs> so, I mean, I know with like the Apple HomePods, you can make a stereo pair and that, but I, do I doubt if anything will ever come out like HomePod will ever have an airplay which surrounds, which you can make surround sound with. Maybe it will. Um, so, uh, but I think that's the main problem is, uh, well, I, I realized as well, I remember buying a surround sound system for my living room uh, um, off Gumtree. I think I paid 60 quid for it and it was a 1200 quid Sony rig. And, you look at, I mean, I think that maybe has passed a little bit now, but, um, you know, the home cinema sort of boom of the early 2000s and all the surround sound systems people were getting, I think it's probably the most often sold thing when people move house. Yeah, they just well, go, it, it's... To <laughs> rewire it all back in again, and it's just like, oh, just chuck it on gum tree. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And, and therefore, I think that is the problem. It's, it's a fantastic and exciting and sort of... Um, psychedelically amusing yeah. surround sound is it just is still probably always going to be a, a minority thing sadly steve do, am yeah, i right in thinking I, that vinyl was was there some forms of vinyl yeah. that were done in quadraphonic i can't wonder how that's even uh, possible yeah i i must admit i don't know how it how it was done but it, it certainly was at least my understanding was that on a consumer level it did start with uh, vinyl and um this was something that occurred to me which was that um, you know, uh, Gaz just mentioned the Dark Side of the Moon, so one of the greatest sounded records of all time and biggest selling records. But it came uh, out in an era where the uh, one of the objectives for your home was to have a hi-fi. And yeah. I think I feel that that's gone now. 
I don't actually know of anyone now who has a hi-fi. Um, even in my own home, I have a, an Apple HomePod and I have a selection of Bluetooth uh, speakers, but I don't have anything that has been designed to give me pristine fidelity. And I feel a bit that, at least on a consumer level, that was what uh, that was one of the selling points of quad, uh, quadraphonic sound, in that you could have a pristine sound, but coming from all around you. These days, I, I don't really know whether the market is there or, or whether the market has actually moved on to to other considerations for audio, which would be convenience, quite frankly. Um, I, I, I wander around most days with a pair of Beats headphones on because I like to look cool. But they're... Um, <laughs> they're <laughs> You know, uh, but they're connected to my phone via Bluetooth, and I've got Spotify, and I, essentially I have everything that I want from music in that package. And I'm an old man. I know, you know, uh, my uh, uh, younger people in my family, they're not even bothered about getting uh, decent sounding, sounding headphones. They'll listen to music on their phones and be quite happy with it. Having said all of that, on the video, the um, the uh, results that the presenter was getting did sound really good and it reminded me of various uh, events that I've been to where there is quadraphonic sound. I went to see a, a Warp uh, gig, it was uh, well over a decade ago now. Uh, they had all the big Warp guys, but not Boards of Canada, uh, doing their thing in quadraphonic sound or surround sound and it sounded incredible. So I'm thinking this uh, multi-channel audio, it's for events. It's not for yeah. personal consumption. Yeah. So if you're at a club, brilliant. If you're at a festival, brilliant. If you're at a in an amphitheater or, or similar that's that's designed for pristine sound, that's great. Um, for those of us who are making, I suppose, more um, modest music, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I've got the time. Yeah, I take your point. I know, I, I, Matt. I don't know whether or not yeah. you know you put you put on events and stuff i mean is it something that's part of it, explored as part of what you do uh professionally in terms of the education side of thing or is it something you've tried uh, artistically for your own stuff or yeah, experienced um, yeah a bit of experience in this so i mean when i studied for my ma i was doing a lot of stuff in 5.1 these were typically choir recordings anything where you was trying to translate space into another space essentially and big cathedrals and churches with vocals going on obviously a fantastic if you if you can record that in multi-channel audio and pump that out into your living room sounds great so that that was kind of like the beginning for me and then i started i started yeah i started mixing stuff in 5.1 not necessarily quad um more 5.1 and i and since then i've i've not really you know going back to like what steve's saying i've not really done much with this because i it's never really felt like it's for the consumer at home and for the consumer who's walking from a train station to a train station and with their headphones on it's more um for an event um it's more for cinema and tv um i love that i love going to the cinema just you know sometimes just for decent sound and just yeah. be totally in the middle of all of that that's that's a biggie for me. Um, concerts can be a little bit hit and miss, depending on what they are. And where um, you're standing, I suppose. Yeah, and absolutely where you're standing. You, there's Particularly with 5.1, there's quite a narrow field as to where you're really going to get that full perception that you're trying to get across in 5.1. Um, I was lucky enough to see um, Morton Subotnik play live with his modular um, at the... Um, at the Funk House in Berlin oh, at one nice. of the Loop concerts. And that was just phenomenal. And I was bang in the middle of the room and it, it was very immersive, sounds flying around your head. That was very, very enjoyable. I've seen rock bands who have tried to do stuff in quad and it didn't, it didn't really work for me. It was just kind of like more guitars in the back behind you as well as in front of you. So it's, it's really got to be like going back to what I originally was saying, translating a space into another space right i think that's when it works and and that crossover from electronic music the subotnik gig you know where you've just got pure electronic instrumentation well the sound off the stage is, yeah the sound off the stage yeah. isn't kind of polluting the the imaging of it i suppose yeah absolutely i was wondering why aren't there over ear, closed ear headphones because you imagine if you've got a pair of headphones that are closed there you could actually mount speakers rear uh, 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 you know 
over the air that are slightly forward and slightly backward. Surely you could make quadraphonic headphones that would work like you that. Might, I don't... <laughs> Actually, Nick, Sorry. I have a, I have a, I have. Um, this is guesswork, but I, I suspect there is a reason for this. Um, what I think it is is that the our perception of space around us um, it, uh, is dependent not just on where sound is coming from, but how it reflects within our own ears. Right. And yeah. so, and so it, yeah, so you might not get, you'll get a, a very strange sense of space if it's coming from behind your ears here. But really, right. for surround sound to work, it, it needs to exist within a space, if you know what I mean. It, it right. needs the, the, the reverberation of the room. And, and the and reflections, also the fact that yeah. You, that's right. So what you, what your head is moving around naturally when you're, uh, you know, just being alive, I suppose. Um, and that gives you a sense of space as well, which I, I just don't think mm. you can get from headphones. But that's but what I'm, that Wave NX... Well, that Wave NX sort of takes into account that with the head tracking, as your head moves right. around, the the, mm. the the speakers stay in the same place. And it is a pretty profound experience. And uh, in the... You know, I've had things in the past, like the VRM box, which focus right thing, but, you know, if you moved your head around, you moved the whole... Sat the whole room around as you moved your head but with these head tracking things you know you move your head around and it really does give you the sense of space it's quite it's quite interesting wow. and it did make me wonder as this conversation was progressing whether uh, now that Audis have released those headphones they're around they're less than 400 pounds so it makes me wonder whether that that technology you know like like i guess a bluetooth head tracking thing is probably quite reasonably cheap technology to implement these days compared to previously so i wonder if we will get another wave of surround sound headphones coming out with this you know maybe waves will license it to sort of more consumer level um <laughs> but i was going to say is, this, was, it, is it, the, is it that? this is it mobius is it the audis mobius oh, you yeah to? that's yeah. it that's it audis audis and i mean it's interesting that they're marketing them very, very much towards like the kind of gamer market. Yeah, well, I suppose that's yeah. realistic because yeah. they, the, the yeah. 3D render of audio is something that, you know, that, mm. but do you, do you think it's perhaps more fun to make than it is to listen to? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that covers most music, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Maybe. I, 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 I think there's a, there is an aspect of, um, I'll oh, pardon the phrase, but boys with toys with this I, I i do to an extent i think we're living in a time where music for consumers is about convenience over uh audio quality yeah and i think yeah and i think that the the leap that is required to go from two speakers to four uh, um i just i don't see well i actually don't know anyone who's done it Quite it's frankly, it's that, a lot of that, that's, well, it's and it's a, it, it, it is a lot of hassle to do. I suppose what we need is is surround sound wireless systems that are really easy to set up. So you're just going to go one there, one there, one there, and that's it, and you're done. But then you yeah. get a latency, and it's all becomes yeah. a little bit less. But uh, there is, but there is one one thing that I don't think anyone's mentioned uh, so far, which is that um, we most of us have got two ears, and we're we're really well served by stereo. I think yeah. this is why it's survived for for so long, mm. and. If, if there was if there was somehow some way of um, uh, matching the convenience of uh, the, of stereo and getting the immersive experience of surround sound in some way, then that would be an incredible thing. I, I at this point in time, I think it's all about convenience. Yeah, um, just on that point of of convenience as well. One of the, I think one of the easiest things to do for stereo, if you do want to get some of this kind of um, spatialization within a stereo mix is re-recording stuff out using a binaural dummy head i've done that before where it might be some percussion elements and they can suddenly be appear like they're playing behind you i've certainly heard it on some of the new records um john hopkins latest album for example has got some binaural stuff going on in there and the first time i heard it i was on a train and i was convinced there was someone behind me clattering <laughs> about and i had to turn around and then you only realize oh this is actually embedded in the recording so by now it's really good there's um there's a great clip on youtube it, it, people should go check this out after after the podcast but uh, it's called the um uh, what is it called the demon barber or something it's someone cutting your hair with a pair of scissors 
recorded in binaural and it's it's as though they are right by your ears and it feels like they're going to take your ears off with the scissors it's oh that, that, not, that sounds like horror doesn't it yeah <laughs> anyway um, i do check out Ooh, Luke pops, yes, Luke pops uh, uh video it's a great one and, and, and some of the questions he brings up i mean he's, his stuff is really good and uh i think you know i mean i don't think he needs any assistance he's doing great uh, in terms of uh, views and stuff but he does make great stuff so well worth watching yeah. Um, okay, let's have a look. Oh, yeah, this was the other bit of news. Did you see this? The uh, Dave Smith rebrands as sequential, which is a kind of weird <coughs> twist, isn't it? I, I wonder about this. It's an interesting ah. concept, isn't it? So not sequential circuits, sequential. So uh, apparently it coincides with the 40th anniversary of the Prophet 5. And the original uh, sequential circuits, Inc. was uh, formed in 2000, uh, 1974, in fact. So, yeah, it's quite an interesting idea. Um that they're going to rebrand and always a tricky business but i suppose <clears throat> most people would kind of maybe associate dave smith with that other brand and, and perhaps it's also i wonder if it's a sort of distance of like you know i don't know how dave is, how old dave is but he must be getting older and maybe thinking actually i want to step mm -hmm. back from this and it not be tied to just my name as well i think there's probably a couple of things about this yeah um yeah this that is actually uh, the, what i was going to mention that uh it's it's very difficult to retire if your company has your name in the name if you know what i mean so like uh, uh, i don't know how old dave smith is but I, i'm sure he's thinking of retiring and so dave smith's in instruments without dave smith it's just not the same thing uh i also think actually sequential is a uh, it's a cooler name and one thing that's for certain is that it's a cooler font if you go back to that uh, photograph that we had um for those of you out there in the world who are uh, font nerds like me that font they use there is called stop and it's uh i think it's available for free on the internet now but it was re it was around in the uh, late 70s and early 80s and i was obsessed with it so beyond uh, the ability mm -hmm. for dave to retire um it's good to see that thing uh come back. <laughs> there was just <laughs> you know maybe at the sun's getting to me now there is just one other thing that i'd, I'd like to mention about this um it's often uh advice that's given to uh, new entrepreneurs or people starting out their company that the thing that you don't want is your name above the door and the reason is that if it's your name above the door you firstly you can't sell uh, because you'd have to sell yourself as well which is defeats the project of selling your company but also you, you you can never walk away in any way shape or form it it's dependent on you being there yeah and i mentioned yeah and i mentioned this to young musicians as well that if you start your career using your own name, you, in terms of branding, you've got nowhere to go. It's just you, Steve Hillier, you know. Whereas if you started um, as a, a brand name or some sort of project name, you can always pull your own name out later if required. If you think of Björk, she had the sugar cubes and then she became Björk. Um, but if you if she had started with Björk, which actually thinking about that's a bad example because she did at the age of twelve. But if you started with your own Christian name, <laughs> it's very hard to rebrand from your name. So I would just for, for the younger musicians who are listening here are thinking about this kind of things, I just avoid using your own name, just like Dave Smith is doing here. Yeah, well, it's also interesting because there was a whole slew. I mean, Tom Oberheim, uh, Robert Moog, you know, all people who used their names for their companies and got into all sorts of horrible sort of commercial. Yeah you know mess and, and uh, unpleasantness where people bought the assets of the company when perhaps it was failing you know in lean years and they end up in these sort of ridiculous situations where they don't have the rights to use their own names which is kind of uh, it's never a, ne never a good place to go but yeah, yeah i think what do you think gaz sequential it looks cooler on the back of a keyboard that and dave smith instruments is oh, written definitely. in sort of comic sans which i think is not so great <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, definitely. And uh, I didn't know that, that that font is called, what did you say? It's called Stop. Stop. The Stop. Font. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Um, yeah, great. I mean, it's, I, it, 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 I think you're absolutely right, though. I mean, I do feel that he's probably, he does, I think he quotes, doesn't he, in that article that he, that he feels that, that the name puts too much emphasis on him and, and he's working with a team of people and he wants the name to be more reflective of it being a team effort as well um which i guess it, it, you know i'm sure it is um but it I, I think it was quite a nice story as well wasn't it the guy from yamaha what yeah was well um, again, Nick? He, he I, i've got it um well roland roland's founder um katahashi kakahashi uh um sort of because yamaha ended up owning it and they didn't do anything with it and i think right. roland 
Roland uh, uh, was founder. One of the things that he did before he stepped down was kind of he said uh, he, he wanted to return the sequential name to Dave Smith in a gesture of goodwill. And it said, uh, "There's a quote here: Once Kakashi San and Yamaha enabled us to reacquire the sequential name, I knew we'd fully adopt it again when the time was right. And that time, at right, at, uh, it's a very unusual um, act of mm. benevolence in the world of corporate business, though, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it is, but." And I wondered whether whether that was in part because of the terrific amount of influence Dave had on the you know on the creation of MIDI in the very first place. Really, it just seems sort of a, seems like a very respectful, honourable thing. Uh, yeah, lovely. I think it's a good story, and uh, I hope sequential flourish. Uh, why? I mean, it probably makes sense to leave it without the circuits bit. Um, although I sort of missed yeah. the circuits bit. Yeah, SCI that's, that's ink, quite cool. You know, I suppose so. Sequential <laughs> ink. I don't know. Uh, yeah, mm. look, but yes, uh, Matthew looks good, looks better on the back of a keyboard. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I remember when Dave came back on the scene and he launched. I think it was the Evolver was his first product launch when he came back out and Dave Smith's instruments. And um, at that point, I thought, hang on a minute, why isn't this sequential? What's going on here? And then, of course, there was there was the whole thing with the name. Sequential is a really cool name, actually. I just had a quick Google. Um, just to see if anyone was putting out music under that name and there there is indeed there's a there's a band called sequential that's a great name i think for for a group and um t spot on what steve was saying there about you know picking a name um it's something beyond your name something i that i was i've recently been going through i had i had to decide whether to go with my own name just on new releases that are coming out on fat cat or whether um whether to change it completely and, you know, I spent a good week sat at the kitchen table pretty much scribbling down names. And I couldn't think of anything in the end. <laughs> and I realized that I'd already had, you know, some I had, I've got some a bit of YouTube going on and I've already got some releases under my old name. And I've got releases out on previous names as well, um, weirder names. So I just kind of went with it in the end. I got so fed up of thinking about a name. I just went with my own name in the end. Yeah, it, it, it's funny that, the, the idea of naming things. I mean, when I did uh, the yeah. EP that I released in uh, July or whatever, yeah, I just thought, I'm going to do it today because I was thinking I'd get more tracks together. And then I just, on the day, I just went, oh, sod it, I'm going to do it now. And I, so I literally, just the first thing that came into my, na into my head for a name, I did that. And then I just you know did some artwork and that was it and i like the I, yeah. I, I like you know i didn't i didn't think about it very much and sometimes maybe instinctive stuff it's got a better fairy tale story about it hasn't it when you do that i mean not that i'm in any yeah. way uh competing in that kind of league but yeah there, there is um something else that I, I just want to mention to everybody here to, to bear in mind this is something that's uh, affect me recently I, I don't want to talk about my own story here but if you're starting to get somewhere with your music you should trademark your name or to be more specific you should register your name as a trademark uh, what that means is is that you, if you if you've got you know a certain amount of activity on social media whatever that you can make an argument that your band name belongs to you however it's not the same as registering it uh, and so it's a process, it costs money, but what it means is nobody else for a period of time, it's 10 years, I think, it might be 20, but I think it's 10, at least in the UK, um, nobody else can use that name. And that could be really important if you've spent a lot of time putting, you know, marketing out there, doing your social media, putting out tunes, just consider uh, sorting out a trademark. It's something that anybody could do just online, essentially, but it does cost money. Don't you have to do that per territory, though? And that's when it gets costly. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Uh, yeah, you have to do it. I, I must admit, I For don't total know. total protection, no, yes. Yeah, you need to... You need to. You can do a protection for the UK on its own. You can do a protection for the EU. You can do a protection for the US. Um, and there's a few treaties that enable them to be uh, sort of streamed out, if you know what I mean, to other territories. It does cost money. I would recommend don't worry about the Far East because they don't worry about copyright, <laughs> so you shouldn't either. But if but if you um, if you're intending to do work in the US or in the you know, like a place like Australia and New Zealand, and certainly in Europe, can register the trademark at that right. point when you're doing well enough to justify it. I'm saying. Yeah, no, it's good. I, I seem to remember looking into that, and I, I, if it's reg trademark registration, 
It might have been a patent. I can't remember. It was like six hundred quid a territory, which seems it, it a lot of money. Maybe it's different in, in for that. Yeah, I, I can I can tell you it costs about two hundred pounds for the UK, and it's oh, similar right, okay. for the e, EU wide. Um, I th- I've patents. I don't really have any. Yeah, any no, that's different, on. isn't it? Yeah, that is different. Yeah, it is. I was getting them messed up. Messed up. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, yes, Dave Smith is now sequential, and that's all jolly good news. I'm just going to um, interject with uh, a little message from Isotope. I'm feeling. This is, of course, Vocal Synth 2, which is uh, Isotope's brilliant new uh, vocal processing suite, uh, Biovox, which vocal tracked modeling. Uh, Vocoder, new improved bands, new GUI, new effects, talk box, lots of things, lots of harmonization, pitch correction. Uh, like I say, vocal track is a really nifty thing that you can do with vocals where you can take it to, if, if the OO or the E isn't pronounced enough, you can nudge it even more in that direction so it becomes clearer. Uh, if you want to check out uh, Isotope's Vocal Synth 2, which has got all new effects and the effects are reorderable, great thing for program presses. You can also have MIDI input for vocoder bands, lots of great stuff. Isotope.com forward slash vocal synth and uh, you get the usual 10 day free demo uh, and it's well worth checking out there's lots of other stuff going on on the uh, website for tutorials and things and we've got a competition um, for this week we're looking for the hashtag textural vocals and the hashtag vocal synth 2 this is a twitter competition so the hashtag textural vocals one word and the hashtag vocal synth 2 to at sonic state and at isotoping enter that into a uh, twitter tweet and uh, we will be able to collect them all at the end of the week and uh, pick a winner from all the entries and we thank you uh, for for sponsoring the prize this week. I hope very much appreciated. And we have a winner from last week's show. Last week's show uh, is uh, from somebody called at CF Salvo. Uh, another week, another try, and uh, they actually got picked. So sometimes, uh, bizarrely, it works out like that. I always, when I'm counting them up, I think, oh, it'd be great if that one won. But I always do a random number generator. So I saw this one and I thought, I wonder if that gets it. It would be quite poetic and they did uh, another week another try uh from cf salvo so at cf salvo if you're um listening or watching then do get in touch and we'll get them to uh our friends at isotope to pass on a copy of vocal synth for you okay what's next oh yeah some new uh well no let's go uh hold on let's let's maybe get this one uh oh yeah i like the look of this right this is a new kickstarter that's just Hi. happening we are the SMEM. this is the swiss museum and center for electronic music instruments in fribourg switzerland we are here at our warehouse in the old beer factory and as you can see just a few a cents of wonderful and rare instruments covering more than 70 years of sonic innovation you will find around a thousand synthesizers and more than five thousand other objects. FX, microphones, organs, tape echoes, drum machines and toys you've probably never heard of. We are a living archive. We want these instruments to be played and heard, so we decided to create the playroom. We'll- so uh I won't play the whole video, uh, but the playroom is essentially a kind of a sub studio of this uh, Swiss Swiss uh, museum, which they'll have sort of fifty things in that you can book time in. You can go in, you can use it, you can just play with them, you can record it, you can film, and they'll change it over every sort of month. So you get a completely new set of instruments in there from their massive thousand uh, instrument and. The thing that really kind of blew my mind is that that photo there, which has been doing the rounds on various things, and that is, I, th- I guess, one row of the synths they have. If this is the warehouse that they would be taking these uh, from, and it just looks like such a great idea. And it's in Freiburg, in uh, which is in Switzerland, uh, and I'm just trying to remember what uh, the, the the this has all started with uh, a guy called Clemens Niklas Trenkel, who for more than 35 years collected synthesizers, keyboards, organs, studio effects, and and basically donated them to uh, this facility and now there are obviously lots of curators I mean who wouldn't want to be involved in uh, in, in that probably and I just think a what a great idea if I can find the Kickstarter what they're, they're doing this really good idea so what they're doing is you know you can pay you 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 pledge certain amounts and some are just t-shirts and some things, but some get you kind of like four days in the room with your synth or, <laughs> you know, do you know what I mean? You get all this time that you could spend. So, I mean, you could actually, like, it's going to have recording facilities and whatnot. It just seems like it's like a dream, a dream thing if you've got the time. And I imagine there's lots of people who are involved in the, the industry that we are. It's sort of it's spoken with reverent tones and hushed tones. That, that have you been there? And I know there's probably a few people have been. Have you ever heard of this place, Steve? I mean, it seems like 
a kind of a, no. a, yeah playground is is too small a word to use no it, it does sound it it looks absolutely extraordinary i remember uh, a few years ago going around to the guy who uh, services my synths uh, house and he had four profit fives on the side he had a, a jupiter eight just a whole room full of synthesizers and and i was talking about that for days this is a man in his 40s and uh, so looking at this thing i i it, it it looks absolutely extraordinary and then I was thinking, okay, so what would actually happen if I went in there? And I think I would be just overwhelmed by choice, overwhelmed yeah. by choice. It would be it would be lovely to look at these things, but I ultimately don't know what I would do. And it reminded me of something um, that I had to do a few few years ago, which was to essentially reduce the amount of instruments that I work with. What I wanted to concentrate on was one or two and know them, the, the instruments I know really well and get the best I can from those. Because I was realizing that in order to compete in the modern music environment, your uh, efficiency has to be really high. Your turnover of music has to be exceptionally fast. And what I didn't want to do is to be you know, stuck with a thousand different choices. So what I did uh, for a project that's going to be uh, coming out hopefully in October, I keep saying that, but whatever, um, was reduce my amount since down to two, which was uh, a Korg Monopoly, which I've had since I was a child, and a Yamaha DX100, which I've had since I was a teenager, and work with that. And it's been liberating. So not to take anything away from these guys, because I'm definitely going to go there. <laughs> right? But in terms of making music, for me, it really is less is more. Um, so I'm going to go there and take photos and uh, do the music making when I get home. Okay. Well, I had a question. One of the questions was uh, which which synth do you think you would grab? Would you want to go to first, given the choice? Assuming, I mean, uh, uh, the one thing I also think is, so you go to this place. Everybody's, you know, presumably there are curators and stuff. And then suddenly, you know, it's like, okay, here it is. And then y there's a massive performance pressure, isn't there? Right now, I've got to do something that I'm not embarrassed about. Yeah in front of all of these kind of people who've <laughs> seen it all knows that they know maybe know a lot about these instruments and it would just be it could be terminally it could actually yeah. crush you creatively and quite you, easily and you know that you know that every single person who works in there is watching you waiting for you to go straight to the filter, the filter. <laughs> that's it <laughs> and they'll have bets they'll have bets and it'll be in swiss francs and uh and they'll make a fortune whilst you look like an idiot the um the synthesizer <laughs> i'll go for i'd like to look at um an original arp odyssey with the moog style filter uh i've, I've got an original odyssey but it's a mark three and I, I love it um but i i've never tried one of the originals i'd like to do that that's a good one i know steve will you be making a pilgrimage to switzerland the next time you're in europe oh me uh, sorry, uh, Matt. Matt. Sorry, what yeah. About? yeah. I'll certainly be going there. I think, I think we should say big thank you to these people. Really, I'm so glad that someone's gone and done this. I think this is an important thing, um, and and now it's done, I can kind of sleep better at night knowing that it's happening as well. Um, you know, for someone to take this on, I I was listening to a podcast the other day where where someone was talking about this very thing. And I thought that would be such a great idea if, if somebody did this and Hey presto, there it is. So happy days. Um, would I go there? Absolutely. What would I do when I get there? I, I think for me, I, one of the things on the, uh, the Kickstarter is the artist Red residency, uh, which is I think 1,800 pounds to do four days artist residency there. And that, that's what I'd go and do. I'd spend four days. I would probably do every single hour. I'd eat there. I'd sleep there. And I would just be pulling all stuff, sorts of stuff out and just try and yeah, there we go. create an album, essentially, and be inspired by by the various bits and bits of equipment that I'm using. Um, you I'd also you also get help with hotel accommodations and get shown around your fa uh, their favourite places in Freiburg. So, yeah, that sounds... <laughs> That sounds like That's a great. deal, doesn't it? What, what? That would be a kind of a city. Darling, we're going on a city break <laughs> yeah. to Freiburg. That's, that's what I was just going to say. How many yeah. people are going to be saying that? Going, yeah. I've always fancied Switzerland. Uh, Freiburg <laughs> looks nice. <laughs> when you get there, oh, guess what? I found a car. <laughs> yeah, but um, it's cool, isn't it? It's very cool. It does remind really me cool. a little bit of. Um, uh, it's not there anymore, but Emis in Bristol, the upstairs, the hallowed 
upstairs in Emis. Did you ever go there? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah, once. It's not, he's moved there. He's moved, it was was an old schoolhouse and upstairs it was just, it wasn't open to the public, but you had to kind of get, you know, you had to apply for permission to go up and have a look there. And there was loads of stuff up there. I mean, not on this scale, but um, yeah, God, this looks fun. Um, Someone just beat me to it in the chat room though. Uh, about what I would pick and assuming that they had one there is a, and it's actually not a vintage synth, it's a newish synth, but the, the niphonium, like, like niphonium or whatever it's called. Do you remember that yeah, thing? I... That all valve. Oh, it's amazing. The and it's still possibly my favorite synth demo I've ever heard, actually. It's fantastic. It's a really kind of weirdy looking. Uh, it's all valves and uh, uh, little kind of weird I'm just joystick. Looking. That, this doesn't Can, look like niphonium. It. Kniphonium, yeah, I'm just trying to find I've got it here, but yeah. uh, what is... Oh, is that it? That's it. Oh, look. Oh. Yeah. Oh, it's a funky a worm. Like the Korg. PS3300. Like the... PS3300, it does. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I mean, I think it's about, about, about 10,000 quid, I think, to buy. It's not, you know, it's, well, it's, it's one of those things. If I ever became stupidly rich for some crazy reason... That's what I would get. That is definitely my dream synth. That thing. I'm just uh, well, yeah. So I wonder. So I wonder, can if, I, I wonder if they've got one. I don't know. Well, they've got loads of yeah. stretch goals in the Kickstarter, which means they would buy more instruments to kind of you know if they if they raise. <laughs> what are they looking to raise? They're not. It's not an incredible amount of money. It's they're looking to raise. Thousand, what is it? Uh, Thirty-eight grand. <laughs> and uh, they've got they've got about uh, just under about a third of the way there, I think. So, and they've still got twenty eight days to go. So, I mean, I, I think oh, they, I was going to put them. Are yeah. they running it as a as a business or as a charity? Um, I would imagine it would be well. I mean, Swiss are fairly canny when it comes to money, so I probably whichever makes the most <laughs> financial sense. I would imagine. I mean, yeah, that's a generalisation, but you know, let's not forget there are a number of banks in Switzerland that uh, would probably advise them on which was the best way to go. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just trying to think what I would go for. Actually, I can't. I, can't, I quite like to. I think. Hmm. Yeah, that's a difficult. I'm going to have to think about that a bit more. So you go for the Nifonium, then, would you? Yep. Definitely. I'd, I think I'd yeah. go with something without keys because I'm not a keys player. So something, I don't know, like a, um, a VCS3 or s- something like that. Anything without keys on it and maybe an, a really interesting sequencer within it. Um, that's what I'd probably pull out straight yeah, away. Yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to think what I would go for. I can't, I can't really think of anything that I really want to get my hands. I mean, I really enjoy <laughs> playing a CS80, but I mean, I suppose, you know, you can still... I mean, Dave's got one of those. I mean, Dave's not got a synth museum, but he's got a synth studio, which has yeah. got... I don't know how many synths they've got in it. It's mm. nothing approaching that number, but I mean, it's a similar experience, and, and they have people showing up who kind of play on that at, at their place as well. So I suppose it's similar. I, I, I can't think what I'm gravitating towards, really. Mm, You're a great player, yeah, though. Yamaha you know. PSS. Sorry. Oh, Yamaha yeah, PSS. <laughs> yeah. SK1. <laughs> so, yeah. A Casio SK1, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I wonder yeah, if they they've have got to a have guitar. One, they have to have one there. They have to have a, an SK1. It is a very, very historical and important instrument. So well, that's true. I mean, yeah, that, I, yeah, I would agree with you. They, they might well do. I know and a Yamaha CJX. I've got a DJX actually, and I played it. The, yeah, I did play the, the uh, Although the problem I've got is my uh, there's something wrong with one of the sensors. So every time you spin the wheel, it resets and just reboots and, and kills the pattern. Uh, oh God! Yeah, we used to use one in the band, and like uh, there was a horrible like it, in its default thing is if you turn it off and turn it back on, it goes. You probably recognise that with the DJX. It goes. It it like it kind of defaults into like a kind of auto a company sort of thing. And it's good though. Gig, I, I... Well, we did a gig once, and the power came out, and it plugged back on, and suddenly it started doing that in the middle of the song. So, the guitarist keyboard player in my band, he booted the keyboard off the djx he booted it off the stage where it flying off the stage landed like knobs and keys that down on the dance floor and um was absolutely fine <laughs> that is surprising. built, built like mean, a toy built like a toy, like a toy but, but um, it's, well i've got the survive. one which is just the box i mean i remember um i when yeah. i, I try to remember i think it was Fla- black cherry gold flat black cherry i sampled all of the drum sounds there are lots of drum sounds in there actually and we used quite a lot of those <laughs> I haven't told anybody Whoa, that. Confession. <laughs> well, I, 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 I used quite a lot of them. I don't think the they, were particularly, they, weren't, they weren't choices, but they weren't sort of choices made by them. It was choices made by me when I was doing the beats. 
I know, but it's a great idea, <laughs> and I think but, uh, it, it's well worth supporting. But Nick, do they do they have a keytar in there? I, they the have question. to have at least one. They've got to, mm. otherwise the place has got to be closed straight away. You could use that. that that's a very Swiss-looking one. You could use that for churning butter I, as well. By I'd actually donate this to them. If I go over there, I'm going to donate this to them. They can have this. <laughs> nice. <laughs> for what it's that, worth. Yeah, no, I think that if they haven't got one, they should probably have them. <laughs> and we did do a thing about ketones, didn't we, a few weeks ago? And it was the, the, it. it I, I, somebody contacted me. I forget the details of it. Somebody contacted me. People got really upset of these various ketar groups on Facebook. They got really upset that we were sort of dissing the notion oh, of no. a ketar. And it was kind of like, oh, well, I you had, know, it wasn't. I had people getting in touch with me to, to, to thank me for sticking up for the ketar as well. So, yes, <laughs> ketar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. I know, Steve. You've succumbed. You've succumbed to the. Uh, you've succumbed to the sun. There. You're looking a bit oh, FBI well, now. Well, I was sort of thinking um, earlier on. If I start just laughing to myself, it's probably because I'm getting exposure. So I, I looked at the um, the stream, uh, the live chat on YouTube, and a few people were saying, "Oh, Steve's going a bit red," and Steve's talking about taking pictures in this place rather than playing the six. Yeah, maybe I am. There is something wrong here. So now here's my hat. The wind's picking up. I guess that must be. What's the name of the local wind there? I like to. I like to find out about the local winds in uh, various a areas. What's it called? Is it the Mistral oh, or I, the I, uh, one of those? Oh, oh, I, I'm afraid I don't know. Ah. I'm a typical Brit round here. I, 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 um, I only. I only speak in uh, English and, and fake Russian. So that, oh, okay. Well, that was that that was actually came up with a pub quiz that I came up with. Is how many winds can you name? You know, name ten winds. It's quite quite difficult. Ooh. But anyway, that's really got Gosh. nothing to do with podcasts whatsoever. Um, anyway, the playroom sounds really cool, and it looks like they're going to make their uh, Kickstarter. I do. I certainly hope so. Mm. And uh, if we can, yeah. you know, put any more people in in uh, in their direction, then you know go for it because i think it's a very worthy thing that i am i mean you would worry about having a place like that what the you know it, what the insurance would be I, and having them all in one place oh, is yes. quite scary isn't it because you know the, um, so the risk. Part, part of the budget remind, part of the budget should go on part of the budget should go on sort of not letting deep purple go and record there i think they've got a bad <laughs> a bad, <laughs> bad history of uh, of recording in uh, uh, it, well it's um, not it, at it least it's not based on the lake geneva shoreline anyway is it that's the uh, that's the main yeah. thing yeah. <laughs> The, just a, just for a couple of observations before we move on. It really reminds me of, of Svalbard. Have you guys heard of that place? It's um it's a seed bank that's up uh, way beyond the Arctic oh, yeah. Circle. I think it's uh, Arctic Norwegian Circle, yeah. or Swedish. Yeah, that's right. It look it reminds me of that. And being in uh, Switzerland, it might survive a nuclear war, which would be nice. Um, just like the seeds <laughs> in Svalbard. The other th <laughs> the other thing is um I I wonder how long it will be before we get a set of sample libraries coming from this place. Mm. Well, that imagine, would make sense. It would, wouldn't it? Just imagine if there was a sample library that covered every instrument in that place, and it was wow. sold in wow. Swiss francs. Yeah, it could I certainly if, help I, keep the place going. I wonder if that yeah. would be covered mm -hmm. in if you could do an artist residence and basically just sample all of them. Whether that's a different deal you'd have to do. I think we'd have to. You'd probably have to talk to the bankers. They they'd be in in charge of that sort of particular <laughs> thing there. I think we should do a Sonic State uh, weekend trip out there. Oh, that would yeah. be fun, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that Let's be fun? Yeah. What a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Stretch yeah. goal. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, when we've got enough sponsors for the podcast to, to fund it, we will absolutely, maybe we should do it as a Kickstarter, our own Kickstarter. That send way, us yeah. all out, send <laughs> us all out to Switzerland for a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, yeah. And uh, then uh, all back to Steve's place out there for us. Yeah, a that sounds perfect. We'll do, we'll do the show right there. Yeah, that's relax. Great, by by that's all means. That's a great well, idea. Means. What a great idea! Yeah, I'm I'm a hundred percent behind mm -hmm. you on that one. Um, okay, there were a couple. There was one other thing which was use uh, new um, new orchestra, not new orchestra, new oscillators for the uh, prologue. Do you remember there was this? Uh, in fact, I oh, think I've got yes. one somewhere. There was the de development board that was uh, given out to a load of developers at Superbooth, which was basically a single oscillator, the digital oscillator for the uh, Korg prologue. And uh, the idea being that they would encourage developers to do their own oscillators. And I did, there were a couple here. Uh, let me see if I've got some, some sounds. This one is, I think, uh, is this Blinds? Yeah, this is Blinds. So this is a, a by a chap called, um, hold on, I've got it, Edouard Digital. It's a versatile two-mode oscillator uh, with Meta PWM engine, obviously great interest to me, uh, and 101 waveforms. You can get it for 39 euros and you just load it in and it gives you an additional, an additional one. 
Uh, and there's a, there's also this one, which is uh, super. This is multiple waves. Uh, FM Monster Organism and Super Wave, uh, 20 quid each, and the other one's uh, 39 euros, 40 for a bundle all each. And you could just load them into your. You could load them into your prologue and you've essentially got like this sort of additional synthesis engine, which is a really neat idea because they opened it up as this sort of open sourced. It's not what's, it wasn't quite open source, was it? You had to have the dev board, but the dev board is sort of next to nothing. And I think uh, you have to follow. So, you know, it gets included in firmware updates and then you can load it in via the uh, software editor that Prologue de develop. I just wonder how many more of these sort of things would go on because it's, it's quite a democratic concept in many ways. Um, anybody yeah. uh, care to? Has anyone, well, we tried to, a pro, has anyone tried a prologue? Oops. I haven't tried a prologue, but we did We did kind of touch on this sort of last week when we was talking about this democracy uh, um, of, uh, I think it was Raspberry Pis, wasn't it? And mm. being able to put your own things into that and make it what you want from it. Um, so I guess there's some of that going on here. And this also, um, I was going to say this sort of reminds me of like the Nord concept back in the day where you could you could do a lot of that within that it was like the first sort of modular in um uh synthesizer made out of software wasn't it and you could you could change all your waveforms and you could i think you could create your own and then um i was first made really aware of this when i was talking about the dsi the dave smith evolver and that came with a waveform editor um and you could chuck your own waveforms into and that was a way of doing that so um I'm really glad to see this this sort of thing happening again, and um, so you 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 guys have made some as well, which sound really great. Uh, sorry. Uh, you, I think you guys have made some as well, haven't you? So, uh, well, we made some Max for live uh, Max for live synths. Uh, ah, so yes, we're able to right. racks, but not uh, the the thing about this board is it's. I think it would it served two purposes. I think obviously one of the reasons was because it has to be done in C plus plus. You know, it's a proper sort of DSP coding uh, scenario, and mm. I think you know part of it was perhaps you know for Korg to you know just see who's out there doing really cl smart things, and it might be that they would then mm. maybe want to work with these people if they came up with some really interesting concepts. I mean, that could be a possibility as well. I don't know, uh, Steve. Mm. What do you think? Have you tried a prologue? And I. And we were we were supposed no, to get one for review, and they just never sent it. And they said it was yeah. two months ago, and I never it just never arrived. So, um, I've been a lifelong fan of core products, uh, and no, but on this occasion, no, I haven't tried a prologue. I do like this concept, though. Um, the idea that you can, you know, get in and and program extra software for existing hardware, I think, is a, a great idea. So I fully support yeah. that. However, um, although I've, it's been a long time since I've done any coding. I, I think that anyone who is doing coding for this needs to read the, the terms uh, carefully. I think it's kind of important that if you're making software that goes into a proprietary piece of hardware, who owns that software? Oh, so you can I, sell. I, I, you no, sell. No, you sell the code yourself. You, these oscillators oh, okay. are third party. You can buy them from those people. It's not via call. Terrific, terrific. Well, that's really good. That was my only concern, and it was nothing to do with call. It's just simply my mm. own ignorance that I'm really uh, mentioning. But there is a big thing. I'd like to mention something that I really like about this concept, which is that I'm so glad that after what seems like my like 40 years, that we're not all still focusing on the quality of filters in DSP. I do feel like we've we've cracked it. Do you know what I mean? I feel that the digital um, uh, filters that we have now they sound really good, and it seems like it's the sound uh, generation that we need to turn our attentions to. And so this is a great move forward. As I think everybody who watches this knows, I'm a big fan of uh, Extra Records Serum, where they seem to have put a lot of their uh, focus on uh, great sounding oscillators and the ability to create your own uh, wavetables within that software. So I think this is a, a, a great way forward. And uh, maybe I should get back into C++. It's been a long time. Did you use to code? Have you done that? I've, I've never mm. done that. Oh, yeah, right. where I started off in music was that I used to write uh, Z80 uh, code, uh, which was mm. absolutely... Well, I mean, I was a bit that's one and zero, is practically, isn't it? That's like machine well, code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, but that, that, that's exactly what it was. And, and that, that's, um, I mean, I, I had a lot of time <laughs> by myself in my childhood, clearly. Um, I just bought myself an instruction manual and worked out how to do it. But that was a really long time ago. Um, and then I got into... Uh, HTML and C++ and, and a, a few sort of scripting languages. But then, you know, girls came along and so did the music career and I kind of stopped doing that. 
yeah, I should get back into it, basically. Right, and girls. I, I, <laughs> I haven't... Uh, I, 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 I've never done C++ stuff. Yeah, Gaz. The, the bl- blinds, though, when I was reading about it, I was thinking, God, this sounds like Dove Audio's WOTF oscillator, and then it goes on to sort of say it. Yeah. It seemed, yeah. I mean, and it, and it did kind of pose an interesting kind of issue there that, um, I mean, I don't even know if the Dove Audio is shipping yet. I mean, that was just a, just a fairly recently completed Kickstarter campaign, a very innovative, uh, I mean, Eurorack uh, of it, Eurorack module of this idea of having two waveforms that you can es- essentially. Um, window create a window between one to the other and 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 blinds goes on to pretty much use exactly the same method i, I think even yeah. says is inspired by it um yeah. uh, and i just kind of thought ooh, is that a little bit too soon is that a little bit immoral to to take someone's idea and to then copy it and then sell it yeah, yeah window trans- that concept before have we really before that came out with Jove. Yeah, so no, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't. Yeah, no, I've just seen that it was a, it was a first introduced uh, in modular mm. equipment by Dove with their window transform function module. Yeah, so no, it, just sort of, it just kind of seems a little bit too soon. Yeah, I or suppose bit, so. I mean, I, I don't know how the law or the kind of copyright or anything <laughs> works. I mean, because I guess they are essentially different people maybe who own a prologue wouldn't necessarily be the same person to own a yeah, Eurorack, well, but I guess true. a certain amount will. Who knows? But it did seem just a little bit dodgy. Yeah, no, I hadn't mm. thought about that. I didn't. Re- I did look at it and I thought, oh, that's similar, but I didn't, uh, I obviously sped read that part. But yeah, that's a fair point. Mm-hmm. It's a fair point, but I suppose, uh, I mean, I guess if we take it back to the original point, which is that, you know, it allows people to experiment with new or I don't know how far you could go because it's literally, it's coding. You've got a tiny, mm-hmm. t- something like 256K of, you know, it's, it's really small workspace because it's very much sandboxed as a separate thing in the prologue. It's not part of the main synth OS. It, it integrates in as its own mm. sort of little tiny kind of uh, uh, um, code area i suppose but yeah, yeah you can download them they're, they're not expensive and i guess if you've got a prologue uh, check it out. and most a lot of people are saying you know that they really dig their prologues and i i, I think i'm just trying mm. to think if i've played i played well i haven't played one that much but uh, yeah maybe maybe sometime i wonder how long that transfer takes to load up these these new waveforms do you know no i don't but uh, i mean i think I don't know if it replaces something that's already in there or whether it yeah. just mm. fills an empty slot that'd be an interesting thing to know yeah yeah, it'd be great. I don't know if you would be able to save that then almost like as a preset so you could just jump between these. Yeah, That'd I'm not sure. Really mm. I mean, my, my approach yeah. nowadays is I, I, what I have behind me is is pretty much it in terms of synths in here. And they all they have been purchased because they've whole, all got different waveforms and types of synthesis within them. You know, I've got something, you know, very basic oscillators through to uh, FM craziness. And just so I can literally get a sound quickly from from one or the other so i guess they're they're offering this ability there and expanding that within the prologue but i just wonder how quickly and how efficient that is yeah no i do. i don't know i don't know that's a good mm. point i'm not entirely mm. sure okay well i think that brings us to uh, the end of our topics at least so uh, but before we go i just wanted to re uh, reiterate that uh, we've got the uh, knobcon live blog uh, from knobcon in chicago next weekend uh, uh, jim hayward will be uh, posting uh, some video from there and occasional photographs uh, and if you're there and you want to post anything and you want us to pick it up if you give it the hashtag ss knobcon 18 not very snappy but i couldn't really kind of come up with anything else that didn't kind of not have have the information so ss knobcon 18 if you tag it with that we'll uh, keep an eye out a search for that we may well uh, whack it into the live blog and it will show up on the sonic state live blog page uh, and yeah and um that's that's it for this week i suppose yes <laughs> i'm just trying to think if i had anything more to say i suppose i did not mm. so uh, yeah i don't know gaz have you got anything to I, add before we go i've uh, well, I've been, uh, I mean, Spectrosonic's Omnisphere 2.5 is now officially out and I've been playing around with my sledge, which is which is something I was really pleased about because uh, <laughs> that was something that Eric promised that he would implement for me and has done with absolutely terrific results. And what I've realised, which is really special, uh, and it's only actually since being able to play with it that I've kind of come to realise this, is that um, it's 
the way they've done it for all the hardware. Uh, so just to reiterate, if anyone doesn't know what they've done, the latest, yeah, the hardware the synth version mappings, of yeah. synth mappings, yeah, which is so much more than just simply um, like a MIDI mapping thing. It's much more it's sort of deeper embedded into the software. But um, what's quite interesting is is that for all of the hardware synths that they've um, that they've mapped, they've essentially created a, a virtual version of that, which which we did know about. Um, but I think what's quite interesting is that. It, like so if if like i'm playing on the sledge and then call up uh like i did with some sub 37 patches and then suddenly you know you're playing like a sub 37 on the sledge but it's like playing a, a synth but with the sledge interface so as, as soon as you then um start playing well certain parameters yeah well they won't be them, mapped i suppose would they but not all of them will be mapped Ah, no, no, they still are. Everything ma jumps to what the sledge mapping is. So, oh, so no matter what patch, yeah, no matter what patch you call up out the whole of Omnisphere, as soon as you sort of change a parameter on the sledge, you've got the sledge interface for it. And it, it it's sort of, uh, it's like really interesting. Like just turn your sledge into a sub 37 or check. Turn, I was playing with a Jupiter 8 as well, you know, and, um, but what does happen though is that if you do things like uh, if you change the filter it changes the filter of whatever the patch is but if i was to like change the filter type from a 12 db there's a little switch that'll change it from a 12 db to 24 db or which um high pass band pass whatever low pass as soon as you press any of those switches then it switches out the uh filter for the ones that they've designated for the sledge mapping so uh and similarly if i was just to change like the oscillators and went to the the wave tape or, or change the wavetable knob then i start changing the wavetables as per mapping of the sledge whereas everything else remains the same as, as the patch that you've just loaded in oh interesting so it's a re yeah it's really interesting it's sort of like you kind of go okay this is a new paradigm we've not experienced anything like this before as i say a lot of people still kind of think it's just a version of like auto map or something like that it's really not and and, and it's something i've mentioned about before that um because it supports all of the roland boutiques well each one of those boutiques then becomes like a bespoke controller for omni Sphere and like to go from one boutique to another boutique is and that same sort of thing applies then it's a really interesting mm. uh i mean i think you can only have it cut you know um it won't jump if you were to sort of be playing on one of the boutiques and then change and then started playing another the boutique I think it it's a you'd have to go and change the hardware designation to right the yeah yeah okay i see right boutique that it is but uh yeah but i mean for those who haven't experienced it seriously have a look at it because it is uh it, it's definitely something that uh, well uh, eric said that one of the goals was to make omnisphere feel like a hardware instrument and um they certainly achieved that but it also is I mean, in my case, do, using it with the sledge is is it's made the sledge feel like this infinity synth now. In ah, and you know, I've always thought, I atmosphere. always thought when I remember mm. I reviewed it, I just thought that it, you know, I always wanted to keep one hanging around because it's just a great synth interface. But yeah, thanks for that. Well, guys. that's what. Yeah, that's why I was saying to Eric, because Eric was going, oh, the sledge, I hadn't really thought about that. I go, yeah, look, it's got the best. It's so huge. It's absolutely, it's yeah. it's almost comically large, the yeah. the uh, the interface. But yeah, it works really well. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that bit of insight. So um, I think we're probably going to wrap things up now. Um, Matthew, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I guess term started. Um, you said you were going on holiday, though. So the students get back yeah. and you and is it like that was in service days at the end of the holidays where all the parents go <laughs> how come how come you have an holiday now how come we have to have extra time but i mean it's it's not you no, it's, i'm sure you deserve it yeah they don't actually come back we don't actually start till october ah, so okay. i've got a little while yet so this is yeah this gives me a time to take a week out and just kind of reset i actually come back the day before graduation which we do at the brighton dome so I'll be coming straight back with the hat and gown on and straight onto the stage um, with the with the students reading out their names, which is a, a, a great day. I, I love that day. I get to meet all their, their family as well and what have you. So I've got a couple of days basically in here before I go off on holiday um, to play with some new kit. I've just got a new module came um, called the Zadar, which is this four 
you can't really see it, but it's four channels of envelopes, but it's complex envelopes. Uh, uh, you can change all the waveforms and oh, right, it's cool. very interesting. So I'm going to have a little play with that before I go away, basically. But uh, right, yeah, a few more tracks. Me. You're welcome, Matthew. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks again. And uh, Steve, thank you for joining us as well and for risking your uh, your, your your skin <laughs> for the sake of the show. It's been much appreciated. <laughs> I have to say, I do feel strange. <laughs> <laughs> it must be it must be sangria time, surely. I, th I think so. Um, so Claire, who's here with me, uh, passed this to me, which I would recommend to anybody who's going on holiday. I don't know if you can see that. Factor, Factor 50. 50. 50. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> but put I, it on I, at the start of the day. Yeah. I, I must admit, if you want a top tip, I use uh, Ryman P20, which is waterproof. That's wow. really good. And it doesn't come off. And that lasts, uh, I think, eight or 10 hours. Uh, and uh, it's not greasy. So you just have to sit around for 20 minutes while it sets or dries or whatever it is. But anyway. Steve, thank you very much Excellent. for joining us. It's been a pleasure as ever, and for uh, and you can see the sun starting to come down now, which is uh, the shadows are creeping longer. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's um, uh, sunset here is around about nine o'clock still, which is rather nice. So ah, there's still three that. hours of uh, daylight here. It's nice. Excellent. Please hear it. And also, Gaz, thank you very much for joining us as well. Um, we'll see you again very soon. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Cheers. Okay, that's it for this week. Uh, we'll, we'll, as ever, we'll finish with our uh, final shot and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks very much for watching. Bye bye now.